Well, welcome, everybody. We're delighted to have you back to our second AI Tsunami seminar. And I'm going to ask Nick in a second to introduce our guest today, Carol. But first, I want to review the pace of change here, because I think this is the thing that's really hard for us to grasp. I'll go back. Hunter-gatherers lasted millions of years. Then we turn to agriculturalists and settlements. That lasted hundreds of years. Uh, sorry, thousands of years. The Industrial Age has been with us for hundreds, hundreds of years. The Information Age for decades and the Cognitive Augmentation Age for months. But this is the transformative moment that we are suddenly getting tools that help us generate ideas. So formerly you used a, um, you know, a chisel and a hammer. It was you guiding the chisel. Today you go into chat GPT and say, help me understand what I should do about this. And it comes back with reasonably intelligent ideas. So this is brand new. This is transformative. And I think it's an extinction event for people who don't get caught up. So helping us get caught up, Nick, away you go. Introduce Carol for us. Well, thanks, David, and thanks everyone for joining. And please, you know, if you have any questions during this conversation, put them in the chat. We'd be delighted to uh, to answer them. Uh, you know, for those of us who joined, uh, those of you who joined us last uh, last time, we had Jonathan Rosenbluth from Cohere, one of the top AI companies in the world, and he really wowed us, I think, with you know what uh, AI can do and the promise of AI. And in the way I think of it personally, is you know a lot of creativity. Um, can be gathered from these kinds of tools, but also a lot of productivity. Um, you know, a report from Harvard Business School suggests that the productivity gains for white collar workers are as high as 90%. So, you know, all sorts of great stuff, right? Super exciting. Hmm. But but <laughs> there's also some things that can go wrong. Hallucinations. Uh, like that's not really Nick. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, so a lot of things can go wrong and it's, it's really important to be honest about it and clear eyed about it. And so today we're going to dive deeper into, you know, some of the concerns that uh, AI can raise and, and some of the things that senior managers and boards can do about it. And for that conversation, we're so, so lucky to have uh, Carol Piovisen uh, with us. Uh, Carol has got a distinguished background. She started her career uh, in government uh, as a uh, policy uh, director for foreign affairs. So that's fantastic. Um, but actually, joined the dark side of of you know private uh, private uh, private Canada uh, and joined one of the top law firms in Canada uh, as their lead for cybersecurity, uh, privacy, and data management. Uh, you know, law firms called McCarthy Tetro, which is uh, just a fantastic law firm. Uh, and um, over the last number of years, she started her own law firm called INQ Law, as well as her own consulting firm uh, called INQ IQ Consulting. She specializes uh, in AI governance and AI policy and AI training. So Carol, we're super, super thrilled to have you. And you've got a, a presentation. I'll uh, pepper you with questions as you go through it. And I'm sure the rest of the attendants will do the same thing as well. So welcome to the AI Tsunami podcast. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. This is an amazing topic. I am so happy that I'm coming after uh, Jonathan, because it is so valuable to understand, first and foremost, what are the use cases? How is this technology reasonably being used in the day-to-day -day for productivity gains, for eff efficiency, for identifying new markets and opportunities, as you said, David, new ideas? So there is this plethora of discussion happening, but it's a bit disjointed and it can be hard to follow. Um, so with all the excitement to do with artificial intelligence and not to be the sort of wet towel on the, the excitement here, but I want to talk about the regulatory component as well, because you are hearing even from some of the top innovators in this space that we cannot just allow this technology to run wild, the wild west and the sort of technological boom that we saw in the 90s and early 2000s that move fast but don't break anything or sorry move fast but and break things mentality doesn't exist in this space or shouldn't so instead we are adopting a move fast but don't break anything mentality because the risks are profoundly harmful so the way i'm going to share my presentation and i'll just preface what we're going to talk about, at least in the presentation part. I am open to all sorts of different questions from there, though, so please do come with questions. Uh, this is your session, so what, if you have something that's a burning question, I promise you it is, it is probably a very good question, and we would love to discuss it. So we're going to talk initially about the 
uh, global AI legislative landscape, okay? And we're gonna cover primarily Canada, the US and the EU as a starting point. And we're gonna do this so we can contextualize what the risk matrix looks like and what compliance is starting to look like. We will then bring that ultimately into a more informal discussion about what boards need to be thinking about and doing. So let's first understand how the law is shaping to respond to all this excitement and risk associated with the use of artificial intelligence. And then let's make it much more, we'll take it from 30,000 feet right down to a more practical conversation of what boards can do. So let me start by just talking about what some of the first principles are when it comes to the law and how it's developing. So the first thing I really want everyone in the audience to understand is that there are distinct risks that have been discussed over at least the last decade, specifically to do with artificial intelligence, and they are leading and guiding the way the law is developing. So when policymakers and legislators talk about how they want to structure some kind of guardrail with AI, they are particularly worried about elements of maintaining uh, certain values, values related to human rights, human control, uh, transparency, certainly accountability for decisions that are made. And we're going we're gonna to have to recognize that decisions are made at different points in the supply chain and how we're starting to think about all those different points and who bears what liability. And then, of course, we are thinking more about, you know, are we at a certain point through general purpose technologies that can be used in all sorts of different functions? Are we scaling, democratizing harm? So in particular, we think about concerns with misinformation and deep fakes, right? We've seen with the use of Cohere's models that you can generate a whole host of outputs that look and feel very human. They is so much so that they can dupe us. And it apply, applying the Turing test of 1946 or 1950, we now know that you know I, there are outputs that are coming from purely computer generated processes that can dupe the individual human, and that's very concerning to us. So what are the guardrails we need to put in place in order to protect against that? We also worry about the world of the past becoming the world of the future. And what I mean primarily with that is the use of these large data sets that are reflective of our history, in some cases reflective of our current state, and they're now being used as um, training data sets for models that can scale what may potentially be very discriminatory outputs and very unjustifiably biased outputs. And we don't want to do that because it subverts the values that we hold very dear. dear. Um, we also worry about bad actors getting into some of these systems and you know, obfuscating their function to the point that there can be outputs that are very harmful, but you wouldn't know it because they're highly complicated systems. So what do we do to make sure that the systems are designed professionally for their intended use and with safety and security baked right into the heart of that system? Finally, the notion of the accountability, right? So how do we set up a structure, a governance structure that is operational, right? And that demonstrates due diligence in the thought process from ideation of the system or maybe licensing of the system through to ongoing operationalization. And what do the controls look like when the outputs finally make themselves into the world and they are being used either internally within an organization or in a consumer facing on a consumer facing basis. And the way it's evolving, and, and I'll tell you, the law is not known for evolving quickly, okay? I'm sure that's of no surprise to absolutely nobody, um, but the law does not move quickly. So we are finding, as we do, that it's we have self-regulatory regimes that are coming up. In the U.S., obviously, you have uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology that released its AI risk management framework as one example. Um, but that is a very good example of a voluntary risk-based approach to AI that is aligning nicely with how we see draft laws coming out. And really what it's saying, as we see in the different draft laws around the world that we're going to look at very quickly, we see that 
not all systems are being governed or proposed to be governed. Rather, we are looking at the use of the system. So what context? Is it employment? Is it human resources? Is it health? And then we are, we, the lawmakers in particular are saying, okay, where you have a high risk or high impact use case because of scalability, general purpose technology, and all the different concerns we've talked about, we want to make sure there's appropriate governance in place. And here's what we think due diligence looks like. So that's what you start to see being baked into different laws around the world. And so that takes us to number two, which is we actually see hard law. So the EU AI Act is the best example of hard law. It has passed. There are um, requirements to operationalize certain aspects of it in relative short order. And um, it is right now being held out as the gold standard of AI law. So when you, when you step back, and this is more at the management level, but when you step back and you think about what does my global, what does my AI governance program look like? You're gonna turn your mind to, well, what are some of the requirements under the EU AI Act? And we're gonna look at that in a bit. The next part has to do with standards and standards being used as a mechanism for benchmarking because these are all new laws. So we need to understand how we're gonna benchmark some of those um, requirements. What does good look like? What does acceptable look like? Okay, uh, so let's turn now just to a few of what the roadmap, the general roadmap looks like. So we see already that in the UK where they were mostly talking about a sectoral approach decentralized to regulators that would take principles related to responsible AI and start to work with their communities to devise sort of sector specific governance structures. Well, we ultimately saw a bill put forward that said, okay, let's take that idea and actually codify it. Like let's start to put some requirements behind this. So we'll see what happens, draft law in this respect, but interesting that they've taken this, what, what seemed like a more regulate like self-regulated approach and they've turned it into hard law. Um, not passed, but still. In the US, I can't tell you how much activity there is. So at the federal level, we have two different laws. My guess is neither will pass, but we have two different laws that are certainly giving flavor to how you're going to operationalize or codify some of these requirements. At the state level, there's a flurry of activity. So we've seen uh, law on artificial intelligence being proposed that are sort of general purpose laws. So they the, the proposed bill will say something like, you know, this, this law is to regulate the use of artificial intelligence in high risk systems. So we're always looking at that high risk use case. And then in other instances, we're actually getting down to a specific use case and seeking to regulate that particular use case, like the use of artificial intelligence in establishing a utilization rate in the health sector. That seems extremely fragmented and it will be very difficult to manage. So my hope is, as we have heard many times in different areas, that we will have a federal law that guides across the US and hopefully that harmonizes with other jurisdictions of interest. Hey, Carol, quick, quick, quick question on that. Um, yeah. And I agree with everything you said, but uh, but the uh, the Biden administration also issued an executive order on yes. AI. But you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Executive orders, you know, have less teeth than you no know, hard yeah. law, right? So that you know, whoever is the next president, or even ten years from now, or fifteen years from now, executive orders can be overturned much more easily than on the, than the hard law. Is that is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, and we're going to look at the executive order in, in the next uh, slide. So the executive order doesn't apply to private sector. It applies to federal agencies, to 50 federal agencies. And it is, in that sense, persuasive. So it shows where the government's mind is at and how the government is prioritizing different considerations, but it's not binding law, okay? So in that sense, it's like in Canada, we have the Directive on Automated Decision-Making through the federal government with the corresponding algorithmic impact assessment. That is a concept that you are going to start to hear more and more about, the algorithmic impact assessment. So stay tuned on more. Um, but that's also, it's just not binding. So it's good when we have, we've seen voluntary codes as well that have come out of the US and Canada as well. 
So China is another jurisdiction that has established some law, mainly to do with the sort of recommendation systems and, and social media functions, as I understand it. Um, but uh, I haven't been able to read the source of it. Um, so I, I've only read interpretations of the law. And then Canada, very bare bones law, Not no need to spend too much time on it right now. We don't even know if it'll ever see the light of day. But the EU AI Act is where um, there is some real teeth and actual movement that will be hopefully supported by standards at the global level. And these these are not just for publicly traded companies, Carol. This is for every operation, private as well as public. It's 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 very good question. So it's actually not even targeting a sector. It's targeting a player. Are you a developer? a deployer, a user of a system, and depending on who you are in that, that supply chain, you will have certain obligations on you to ensure that the systems are created in a manner that are defensible. Okay. And so defensible. I, this implies police forces too then, doesn't it? To bring it this can. It can. So it depends. Uh, if you look at, at, for instance, I'll just take the, the Canadian example, um, the ADA as an example, it specifically carves out certain public sector functions and departments. So it may, if you look at the EU AI Act, then you will see that there are certain prohibited uses um, or high risk uses that are obviously governed by the act. And in that instance, yes, some uses of AI and law enforcement would be considered. So it depends on the jurisdiction. Okay, and do these things in aggregate tend to reduce the creativity of the free enterprise system in favor of the rogue states? I mean, we're putting shackles on people to be creative and innovative, um, which yeah. are going to be applied to Russia, North Korea, Iran. Um, it goes on and on and on. The mafia. That's the argument. Honestly, the argument for many, many years has been, is regulation going to stifle innovation or is regulation simply going to foster responsible innovation? Um, and my own viewpoint on this is, if you look at the way these laws are constructed, they're framework laws. So they are laws that are, except for the EUAI Act that drills much, it's much more prescriptive, but by and large, they're telling you what you need to do to demonstrate diligence in your process, okay? And that's not a bad thing. Obviously, there's also enforcement, so there's recourse if you step out of line in a way that is offensive to the law. Um, but they are setting out the guardrails. And the thing is, the lack of guardrails up until this point has been a distinct argument by enterprise clients who have said, we don't want to use this technology because we keep hearing about risk and we don't know what to do to use it safely. So in a sense, Sometimes this tech, these types of regulations actually support adoption and the impact on the sort of creative process isn't really felt um, early on. So we'll see with the EU AI Act, certainly what the impact is given how prescriptive it is. But um, I think there's still a lot of space to move. You just have to move responsibly. Let's Carol, turn. Carol, we've, uh, we have a question here, kind of going back to your uh, to your previous slide uh, from Frank, and it's a great question. Uh, Frank's like, look, you know, most companies are going you know, to operate worldwide, especially the large companies. Um, and so, you know, what are your thoughts on setting global guidelines? I see you've got global standards here from ISO and IEEE, but yeah, uh, you know, those particularly, you know, probably don't have any, you know, punishable teeth, right? You know, so if you're if you're a you know a large company, um, how do you, how do you think about the patchwork that's happening? So the two two questions: one is that there's going to be a patchwork of laws by state, by country. So that's one issue, and the other yes. issue is what are the uh, what are the odds of this being harmonized globally so that we have a universal declaration of AI, you know, uh, of AI law, if you will. Yeah. That last one, I'm not sure about. I'm not sure we're going to get a universal declaration that that if, if it exists has any teeth. But here's what I'm going to say to that question. I want to walk through the ADA, Executive Order, and EU AI Act as examples of law. And then let's talk about what that global program looks like, because it's a great question and it's one I get all the time. So let's, I'm going to hold the answer until we've seen how the laws evolve, and then we'll have something more con concrete to, to, to look at. Okay, so in ADA, 
So the, the one thing lawyers love to do is jam a bunch of words onto a slide. So I'm going to apologize up front that it is so, so crowded, but I want to get everything on one slide so we could work through it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, we're pretty proud of that skill. So what we've got here, you've got a very high level, bare bones law, very framework oriented, that is seeking, it's taking a risk-based approach to AI, stating that in the event that you're using a high impact AI system, so uh, let me say that a bit differently, an AI system in a high impact use case, and you've got examples of employment, um, biometric information, healthcare, emergency services, certain um, judicial decision-making or administrative decision-making functions, then you need to implement certain governance requirements. And the governance requirements are broken down by the developer, the deployer, and those who are responsible for the ultimate use of these systems. And the interesting thing here is that it's setting up a separate, so, so by and large, the requirements that you have are to be able to demonstrate your assessment of your data assets that were used to develop and train the system. You will have to demonstrate you know, the robustness and appropriateness of the system for the intended use case, and then you will have controls in place for the output. And here's the spoiler alert for what you're about to see in the EU AI Act, which is they generally have the same requirements, just they are much more prescriptive about what you need to do to comply. So ADA, the operative provisions are about 10. Uh, EU AI Act is about 250 pages. So it's it's a very different approach to the law. The hey, other Carol, interesting, yeah, you've got the uh, the penalty as no more than ten million and three percent of global revenues. Is that is ten million the cap or the three percent is the cap? No, it's whichever is is uh, bigger, but also it's in the event of non-compliance. You also then have potential broader penalties for flagrant misuse and in some flagrant violation of the law, which would also include some element of criminal liability. In that case, specific to the individual, and frankly, for actions, limited actions that are generally related to what you would have already found within the criminal code by and large, okay? So there, and this is an issue, uh, this criminal liability component sets this particular law apart from the others. You don't really see that in other um, AI related laws. Um, and there are more sort of constitutional reasons why that's in there, I think more than anything else. But the other oh. thing, yeah. I, you know that, and then sorry, um, this is so interesting, right? The um, operation of an AI system knowing could likely cause physical or psychological harm. I mean, what is the definition of psychological harm in this, you know, in this law? Because it's obviously, you know, people see that as it can be defined in many different ways, and then you've got up to five percent of your global revenues at risk if you if you cause psychological harm to somebody. Well, we're going to we're going to see this in Canada and the EU. There are a lot of there are a lot of terms being used that we need to better understand. And either that's going to come through regulation or it'll come through guidance. So we definitely need more clarity. This particular law has been heavily criticized uh, because when it was first issued, it was so bare bones. It said it was a law that applied to high impact AI systems. And when you look for the definition of high impact systems, it said subject to regulation. Now we have a little bit more guidance further to amendments. Okay, I'm going to ask Chat GPT number four how I get around it. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to ask. Carry, how can I carry on my business, Chat GPT, without attracting criminal liability? Because I'm not going to stop doing anything I'm doing. And no, and I don't think it would. It really does when you read. So first of all, it does it is specific. So person is defined in the law, and it in this particular provision, it specifies individual. So it's making a distinction. Um, but also it is looking more specifically at like substantial harm. You're, you're going to have to reach a certain threshold of harm that you're creating that is intentional and that is substantial. So the likelihood that any reasonable business is going to be engaging in this kind of activity, unless you've got some kind of really malicious internal action, very, very low is my, is my guess. Hey, and Carol, uh, uh, on Canada, we've got a question from an attendee. Um, who heard that there's a 2025 target for Canada's uh, regulatory systems to actually have an AI law, uh, especially, yeah. in the, in, especially in the healthcare industry? Is that is that true? It's 2024, and the law. This is a law that's still being debated in the House of Commons. Um, I was I was there 
testifying probably a month ago on this particular law and we're very far away. So 2025 seems ambitious at this point. But you will note that there is, uh, they're standing up an AI or they're proposing to stand up an AI and data commissioner. And this you will also see in the EU AI Act, okay? So that is a particular body or function role that has oversight and um, uh, sort of responsibility for the law. Now, in this case, it is a senior bureaucrat. So it is not someone who is accountable to parliament like the privacy commissioner at the federal level here in Canada, but it is a senior bureaucrat that will have the ability to exercise some of the functions that are in this law that you will also see in the EU AI Act, which is an audit function or a record, like a documentation demand function or some kind of oversight to ensure that where there is a, a concern that there is some ability to go in there, have a look and make sure that things are operating uh, appropriately. Otherwise, and you will note in the last bu bullet under oversight that where there is a serious risk of imminent harm, the minister or delegate, so in this case, probably the commissioner, can just shut down the use of that system. Um, and we've seen this in the US as well, where the FTC has come out and in fact has executed on concerns with the flagrant misuse of data for the building of AI systems. And so they implemented what they called algorithmic disgorgement and they shut it down. Uh, this is not a, a new concept and it's a way to ensure that all laws that are already set up or will be set up to protect against harm associated with this technology are, in a sense, respected. Do you have an example, by the way, of a system that was shut down in the U.S. for that? There, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I'll be honest. The name of the company is escaping me, but there, if you if you actually just look up FTC and algorithmic disgorgement, you will find the name of the company. Um, and I'm trying to remember. I think it was probably two years ago now. So in the US, the White House executive order, as I've said, we've talked about it, the fact it's not binding on private sector, but it's certainly persuasive. Um, and it is uh, focused primarily in areas of security standards. So safety and security, if you look at the blueprint um, for the Bill of Rights on AI that was put out, the draft blueprint, it was put out by the White House about a year and a half ago. It too reflects these concerns around safety and security, respect for privacy, um, respect for civil rights, ensuring we're standing up systems that aren't ultimately going to cause significant harm to individual rights and freedoms. So we've seen at the New York City level, a law on artificial intelligence come out saying, you wanna be using AI systems for recruitment and employment purposes, then you have to demonstrate that that system has been put through an appropriate bias testing and you have to provide notice and disclosure to the individual that they will be participating in the use of that system. So this is a very much a high, hot sort of um, high priority in the US and it does mirror the underpinning principles of the law in other jurisdictions, okay? So issues of non-discrimination, safety, professionalism, human control and oversight, um, privacy, those are those fundamental AI ethics principles that we looked at in the first slide that underpin the law. If you want to look at a good articulation of the principles that I say are best being codified in law, I encourage you to look at the OECD principles from 2019. They're very short. There are only seven. And you will you can start to trace what those principles look like and literally how you find that those principles are making their way into law. So here in particular, something I just want to highlight is um, not only the lead role that NIST will continue to play when it comes to standard setting, um, specifically when it comes to that cybersecurity element, which NIST is very well known for, but in the AI context in particular, the encouragement and the, the sort of requirement to use a privacy preserving technique like differential privacy, synthetic data, homomorphic encryption, whatever it may be. And then ensuring that there's effective supports for workers as well, as well as the other sort of features that you find here. It's super interesting and you're gonna find this within your own organization that the, the executive order calls on federal agencies to stand up a chief AI officer. 
And again, if you haven't heard of that before, like the algorithmic impact assessment, I want you to know that when we talk about jobs being lost and jobs being created, that's one of the jobs that will be created. You will start to see a chief AI officer um, more frequently within an organization. And so lots of encouragement to stand up a good governance, AI responsible AI governance program, uh, implement red teaming strategies to, in, to sort of test the security of those systems across the life cycle, the data assets, the models themselves, and then look at those outputs look turn to and start to appreciate some of the privacy preserving techniques to be able to leverage large data sets including personal information and but being being able to do so in a privacy preserving manner and then for any type of content like what's coming out of cohere that's exciting stuff uh where it's generated or manipulated by an ai system making sure you've got that watermark so people know so i know that this is ai generated soar is a great example I was blown away with half my family in the film business. I was completely blown away by how amazing the quality of the, the imaging and the video look, you know, is. And the first thing I was thinking is, you're going to need a notice at the bottom. Like, this is unfortunately where my mind turns, but you'll need a little notice at the bottom saying AI generated work. Um, and I think that's what we're going to start to, to require or some kind of notice at the beginning. So, Carol, is it fair to say that in the US, at least for now, um, what is likely to happen is every one of the governmental agencies is going to start to change their rules and regulations with an AI twist to it without necessarily having laws on the books. And I think you'll start to see that in the procurement requirements, right? So already I see when I support, when I um, advise tech clients in particular, the what we're what the, sort of what's becoming more and more commonplace is this AI addendum. So how do you just as you have with a privacy or security addendum to your master service agreement, not to get overly boring and technical here, but just indulge me for a sec. Um, you're also going to see this AI addendum that itemizes how the flow of liability works because these laws are role based. You want to understand who's who's responsible for what in the use of this system. Um, you're not going to have it for everything, okay? It's not going to be for every single use case that is involving the quote-unquote AI model. It's where you're dealing with something that is more high risk or perceived to be high risk. And I'll tell you that what is high risk is, and you're going to see this here actually in the EU AI Act, is a, a little bit of an elastic term. So in a sense, we're building in discretion so that you know, organizations can determine for themselves if something borders on high risk and then start to flow through those requirements related to security, audit, data, um, model maintenance, and then any type of output, depending on the nature of the relationship. So the EU AI Act, obviously, this is the one, I mean, if you've got two, three hours on a weekend where you want to do nothing but read law, which I'm sure everybody has that experience, um, you should pick up the EU AI Act. It's a great read. You're going to love it. I promise. Um, no, I don't, but uh, you should definitely read it. And it will tell you the sort of entry point of the AI Act is that use case. Okay. And it's the intended use. So they provide this pyramid of criticality of risk, which says there are some applications of AI or uses of AI that are prohibited. And you've got them listed here. Social scoring based on behavior or personal characteristics. What exactly does that mean? So we understand it in certain contexts, but could it be given a much broader definition? We're not really sure. AI systems that manipulate human behavior, again, is that marketing? I don't know. So we're going to have to figure this out. My guess is the answer is no, because that would seem overreaching and unreasonable, but we're going to have to figure this out. So. Where you get to the high risk systems, however, there are positive obligations depending on the role for things that you should do. And Nick, I know you've heard me say this before and I'm gonna say it again. I always break it down when I have to think sort of critically about this, I break it down into three buckets. Bucket one is what are your data assets and how? what are those sort of validation, what are the testing, what are the um, quality measures that you put in place to demonstrate that you have used appropriate data assets that comply with the law um, and that are appropriate for the intended use of the system. 
So there are a series of assessments and considerations you will want to put in place for your data assets. Then you have your model assessments as well. So the professionalism and robustness and security of that model. Did the right you know, skill set um, develop the model? Is it the right model for the intended use case? In the event you're using it for something that is super high impact, have you have, do you have explainability measures in place to be able to explain the output to the extent that's required? And then there will be the outputs, right? So what controls do you have in place to mitigate against unintended consequences? What controls do you have in place to provide notice and disclosure? And that will be on the output side. So generally speaking, when you think about what the positive obligations are at a high level under the EU AI Act, you have those types of obligations that are making their way into the operation of these systems where the system is used in a high risk or high impact circumstance. And that again, you're touching on issues of fundamental human rights, uh, property, human, you know, um, civil liberties. Uh, you're you're really focusing in on um, where the output could harm the individual's position. There are also some guardrails for general purpose AI, depending on how you're using it. So if you're using it in a lower risk context, you just have notice and disclosure obligations. Otherwise, if it reaches high risk, you're going to be following the, the trifecta of sort of data model outputs. And then there are some pretty important sanctions associated with it that are worth noting. They are stricter than what you find under GDPR, which certainly indicates to you where the regulator's head is at. We will see AI supervisory authorities stood up across Europe. We've already seen it in countries like Spain. So that is something that you will have to start to um, recognize and, and we'll, under, we'll start to understand their role much better, but they do have oversight abilities into the use of those systems. So with this law that is coming into effect in some instances in short order, well, how do we interpret it, right? It's words on a page, but the law is never words on a page. It's always contextual. It's always nuanced. Um, and so we all we need to better understand specifically what to do. Well, in a sense, we will turn to standards. So we are waiting for the European standard body, Sensenelec, to provide a host of information and guidance and standards related to conformity assessments. So the one thing I did not mention is if your system falls within that high risk category, you cannot use that system in the EU market without passing a conformity assessment and getting a CE marking. So you, so there are some real obstacles to not complying in addition to the regulatory fines that are put in place. We will look to Sensenelec, we will look to other standard setting bodies to help us better understand what those words on a page mean and how we can possibly benchmark you know, acceptable practice. So we have some examples here. You will see the, the um, PDPC from Singapore. Singapore actually put out a really interesting AI trustworthy, like trustworthy AI framework a few years ago called Verify AI. That's worth looking at. It is focused on private sector. It has been piloted by a number of global companies. So it is certainly worth looking at and using as a model for what an AI governance framework, at least as a starting point, could look like. You can also look to sector-based regulation, right, or sorry, regulators that are providing guidance. So the U.S.'s Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission has put out some guidance on what bias assessments look like. And we've seen guidance put out from, you know, financial regulators in terms of what model risk management looks like. And then finally, obviously, the global standards. So we are, we know, for instance, that ISO has put out its standard, the 4201 standard, there will be a suite of them. And that standard is used to establish what benchmarks for responsible AI governance processes look like as well. So it's a management standard. It's helpful if you need a starting point to inspire ideas of what AI governance looks like within an organization, it's a really good resource to turn to. And so that's where I wanted to sort of conclude the more formal part of the remarks, but I want to turn to two more things before 
we um, sort of open it up to broader questions. And I'll just stop sharing for a second. So the first is the question that Frank asked, okay? What does a global AI program look like? Right now, there are two ways of approaching it. The first is do what you did for GDPR and align to the EU AI Act. And if you do that, you're going to be aligned with whatever else is being proposed. The thing about that is that it's if you're not if you're not active in Europe, then it's a high bar, okay? In which case you take the spirit of what the law is saying and you implement an AI governance program that adopts that spirit. So not the nitty gritty of every particular requirement, but the general spirit of what it's protecting against. And you start to bake that into your AI governance program. So, so Carol, like what you're implying, I think, is that the EU is likely to have the strictest law on the books, you know, a number of years from now. Is that, can I, is, is that what you're saying? Strictest, uh, it's the first one out there that is being passed, that has been passed. It is, uh, covers a huge swath of the market. So there's an important market that's, that's going to be governed by that law. And we, and frankly, historically, we've seen Europe do it with the GDPR. They set out the standard. They weren't the first to come out with a privacy law. Absolutely not. Uh, GDPR is not the first privacy law. There had been privacy law in place for 20 years, but once it came out, it became that sort of quote unquote gold standard. And so everyone just followed. Okay. And I think that same concept then applies. Um, and again, when I say the spirit, I mean understanding the principles and then figuring out how to build a responsible AI governance program that is tailored to your organization and its likely uses. So at a management level, what does that mean? It means Sort out what your big ideas are. So what does your what does your you know three year roadmap look like? Blue sky it as much as you can, and then look at what capacities you already have in place. What does data governance look like for you already? What does privacy and security governance look like for you already? And then how can you simply augment to AI? So in some cases it means there will be certain structures that you might create de novo. But otherwise, you're just taking things that you have, like processes, policies, structures that you already have in place, and you're augmenting to match those sort of AI governance, if not requirements, then certainly principles, okay? So that would be a, a very reasonable approach. And I think it's one that if you're not doing it already, it's going to become much more cumbersome to do that down the line. Uh, because we are, we do want to see adoption of this technology. We want it to be responsible. We don't want to have all sorts of harmful effects that come into, you know, and come to be. And not only do they harm the individual, they set back the entire progress of technology indefinitely. So we want it to be responsible with positive ROIs. If you're at the board level, you need to be thinking about some of those indicators. So number one. Is, is has there been sufficient training and understanding of the opportunities and risks? Do you understand where your market is going, where how it's being used, where there are distinct benefits, but then do you also understand what the corresponding risks look, look like? And are you asking the right questions, particularly from an indicator perspective? So do you have the right, are you getting the right KPIs in terms of the ROI for the use of that technology, right? Do you have the right um, KRIs? Do you have the right key risk indicators in place so that you can assess the degree to which there is risk either materializing or you know, how are you mitigating those risks and is it effective? Um, and I think that's a key area for boards to be asking and uh, to be probing a little bit more on management. So what are we thinking in terms of what our strategy looks like? How does it feed into our competitive advantage? What are we doing to establish more responsible programs in place? What level of education, digital literacy is there within our organization to support effective adoption? We know from cyber, it's not a technology problem, it's a people problem. So we have to figure out how are we equipping those within our organizations with enough information to feel comfortable adopting. You'll, you'll have seen in the executive order, really interesting that there's a specific carve out on supporting workers. 
So it's a distinct concern, even at that level. And, uh, and then, you know, how are we going to assess risk and be able to mitigate risk effectively without what we saw last week, the Air Canada example, where Air Canada was sued for $650 or something because the chatbot that the passenger relied upon misindicated the bereavement policy, causing the passenger to rely on the misrepresentation to the passenger's detriment, thereby making out a very good case for misrepresentation by Air Canada. And for $650, uh, caused global news about how the chatbot has resulted in a lawsuit. So Carol, when I saw that, you know, and you and I chatted about it, um, I went on a car dealership website and used a chatbot and convinced it to sell me a $55,000 truck for a dollar. And I convinced it to, to tell me that this was legally binding, right? So I now have a printout <laughs> of a chatbot at a car dealership <laughs> saying, you have a deal for a dollar for the $55,000 truck. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, is it, if a chatbot says something, is it in fact legally binding? And what seems to happen so far, at least in Canada, is yes, it is. Wow. Well, I mean, this is the thing. This is where we have to be, we're going to have to figure out what are the controls that you put in place to be able to rely on chatbots for low-level triaging of customers' service functions, right? It's a very good use case for a chatbot, but it's got to be pretty low level and pretty triaged because the fact that a misrepresentation, like the, the, in this case, the passenger didn't create the chatbot, like they were interacting to their knowledge with something that is endorsed by Air Canada. It's on their website. It has information about the policies and the, and the processes. So it's understandable that this passenger would ultimately rely on that unless you have some kind of disclaimer, I suppose, and I will leave this to Air Canada's lawyers to figure out, but you put a disclaimer that says, you know, to the extent that there's anything that is, you know, in terms of advice and not further triaging, <clears throat> that's not legally binding, you can't rely on it. But you've got to give someone something more. Yeah. Hey, Carol, that was fascinating. And my, my mind is spinning and it's obviously very complex. So I'm going to encourage uh, people in the chat to keep asking questions, but you no, know, David and I will, will keep peppering you. Um, you know, eleven percent of what employees put into Ted GPT today is confidential information, <laughs> and I'm not, uh, you know, and, and I'm not sure that employees know that whatever you put into Chat GPT stays into Chat GPT. If, uh, if you don't have your own kind of corporate version of Chat GPT, if you will, and so if you put, you know, if you're writing the earnings release for next quarter and you ask Chat GPT to help you write it better, it is now public, right? Yeah. So how, you know, how are companies dealing with this issue right now? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are two primary mechanisms we're seeing. The first is uh, much more training, like much, much, much more training, investment in expo exposing where some of those risks are and, you know, what are the appropriate uses of technology. And the second is exactly that, the development of an acceptable use policy for generative AI, where you provide much clearer guidance in terms of what is an appropriate use, what is a prohibited use, and then where, you know, further assessment needs to be done and by whom. So when we develop um, what we call AUPs, acceptable use policies for generative AI, I always also bake in an appendix that explains a little bit of the risks and benefits. Because every opportunity can be used as a training opportunity, even the driest of policies. Let's go a little bit, there's a couple of questions on governance. Let's go a little bit deeper on governance. So let's start with the board governance. Um, you know, and I'm on a number of boards as well. And David, you've been on 40 boards throughout your career. Um, you know, does, you know, is, is are people doing, you know, is there an AI governance committee being stood up? Or is the governance committee starting to handle these issues? Is it a technology committee? Or is it the whole board's job? Like, how do you think about, you know, board level governance for, for AI? So I think what we're going to see more of, I don't see that, I don't anticipate an AI governance committee at the board level. I do anticipate at the management level, but not board. At the board level, I think we're going to want to find somebody that has a little bit more of that technical and AI governance expertise on the board. And we see that in cybersecurity as well. So um, my, my, I always say cyber AI is the new cyber. What the processes you put in place, the thinking you had in place for AI 
is um, or for cyber is exactly the same that you're going to start to do for AI, but obviously tweak to content. Uh, at the board level, you're going to want to see that as well. You're going to want somebody who can bring that context and that expertise into the organization and provide that education and that insight. Yeah, we've done some work on 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 what boards are doing. Uh, they're not getting younger. That's number one. <laughs> it's kind of surprising. I reach out to my grandson when I have a problem. I can't. I don't reach out to my grandfather. Uh, but what we're seeing is a as a tripling in uh, skill sets that are which are recorded in the nomination process for the directors. So there's been a tripling yeah. of the number of directors in the S and P 500 who have, in some way, shape, or form, a digital technical competency. And mm -hmm. I suspect that's going to migrate perhaps a little bit more into the legal framework as well around uh, data protection and security. So mm -hmm. skill sets are emerging that are dramatically different, but age isn't uh, a factor yet, maybe. <laughs> uh, and Carol, it's going to switching now to you know, corporate governance at the company level, not the board level. There's a great question here. Like if, if you're a Canadian organization and you're building your governance program, should you look to the EU AI Act right now to develop the structures or should you look to IDA? Uh, are they similar enough that they're going to rely on the EU AI Act as it's not completely adopted? How, what do you, how do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, if you are a Canadian organization operating only in Canada, I would, I would do what I had said earlier, which is adopt the spirit of the EU AI Act. And I think that is, I think you can read that into ADA. Okay. So I would not necessarily uh, hold my, and depending on where you are as an organization, but it can be, it, it will be a lift to certainly comply with the EU. If your plan is to ultimately be in the EU in any event, then get started. If your plan is to be in the US only a North American company, then adopt the spirit because the spirit of the EU AI Act is 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 what is being harmonized across those jurisdictions, but the sort of nitty gritty of it would not be necessarily implicated in Canada and the U.S. for the next you know foreseeable future. So I say, depending on who you are and where you are in the world, and certainly what your strategic plan looks like, the EU AI Act will serve as a north star. But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to implement every component of it. You might just draw from its spirit. Um, one thing that really kind of came clear out of your, uh, your great presentation was that, uh, the laws, uh, are going to, are really looking at this on a case, on a use case by use case basis, right? So it's not like, a, Hey, we're using facial recognition. It's really, we're using facial recognition for this, you know, rather pedestrian purpose versus we're spying on people, right? So like the same technology can be used in very, very different ways. So at, at a, you know, corporate governance level. And maybe also as the board governance level, like how do you vet these use cases one by one um, before they go to production? Like, what is the role of the board? What is the role of the company? Because again, it's not an AI governance policy, really. It's a use case by use case governance policy. Yeah. So the way I always think of it is the entry point is your impact assessment. And I had, I warned you that this is going to be a concept that you need to start to become more comfortable with and certainly a, an assessment model that you have to develop. The ISO, uh, I think ISO is coming out with a proposal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that will be what's followed across the board. The government of Canada has an example. We were one of the first to come out with an AIA. But the point is, the first thing we need to determine is impact. And in some cases, it's obvious, right? You're using it in to determine employment and recruitment. Go back to those principles of the first slide where you are hitting on areas that could potentially cause harm to that individual, to property, to their rights, to sustainability, where you are there. It's pretty obvious that there is a you are in a high impact category. So what I would call bucket A. And so governance is required in that bucket A. Where you are using AI, whether real or, or now just everything is AI, but whether where you are using AI in a very low impact, low risk circumstance, there is, there is more bucket B, which is you can use it without all of the encumbrance, okay? And so I just wanted to say that the, the, the impact assessment is your entry point to categorization between A and B. But then you have to, if you're an A, you're going to do a risk assessment to identify where there are potential risks, and you're going to have to mitigate against that. 
which is in many jurisdictions what you would do for a privacy impact assessment as well. So you would undertake the same, like the trigger would be this at the same level. It's just you're asking slightly different questions. So perhaps not practically. So I'm, you know, I'm a developer. I'm about to build a new AI system. Can it take us through the, the process? Like, you know, do I go to a, an AI committee at the company? And right. then what, what, what does the board do? Like, what, what is the process before yes. I can actually start building this tool or, or launching okay. Great question. So the first thing we want to understand is what is the intended purpose of the system? How is it going to be used? So you are, if you are using, let's say you want to use, um, you know, you want to build a new AI system for to determine who should get compensation and promotion increases. Okay, great. So we know this is going to fall within a high impact system. Okay, we know this from EU inspiration. We know this from Canadian inspiration. We know this from US at the regulated level, like at the state level. So we know that, great. So now we're in bucket A. So I'm a developer, I'm in bucket A, what do I do? I would put together a business case that would say, here is the intended purpose of the system. Here is how the si I propose the system is built. Here's the data set I propose it's built on or drawn from. And I have already, if I'm mature, I have already thought through where, what the, the sort of impact may be and where I can start to see risks. I would then take that to my AI governance or ethics committee, you can call it different things, for consideration. Where you are in a distinctly high risk circumstance, it might, as a, and I would not imagine this on a case-by-case -case basis unless it's very high risk, then it might make its way to the board, but really you will find it within that committee that should have senior members on it. So a decision can be made, and we can all do the one thing we absolutely hate doing, which is documenting the answers. So we will need to provide, since we are in a world of perpetual due diligence, we will need to be thoughtful about what we decide to document and how we show our decision-making process so we can demonstrate due diligence. Carol, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was fantastic. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, there's a question about, um, you know, will the PowerPoint be available to participants? I'm assuming that's okay with you. We can share that. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. I know Quinn, you've got a, a last minute message here as well. Hey there, thanks everybody. I'm Quinn Lawson, uh, Community Manager for AI Tsunami. Carol, thanks a ton. Where and how can people engage with you? What What's a typical engagement look like? Um, so, I mean, there's the the typical legal engagements um, that would be, you know, especially in the world of AI, it's interesting. It's the AI addendum. It's the AI liability assessments. I find fascinating. I love doing them. Uh, on the consulting side, if you need help with AI governance or any part of it, so the impact assessment, the vendor risk assessment, the procurement considerations, we're there to help. Excellent. Thanks, Carol. And uh, looking forward to getting that PowerPoint for everyone who's attended and signed up. We'll be sharing the recording. Uh, our next webinar is on March 22nd with Gopi Kal Kaliel. Sorry if I get that last name wrong. He is the Chief Evangelist for AI for Business at Google and a board member at the Grameen Bank. Uh, his talk will be on using AI as a force multiplier for really large institutions and corporations. Um, on behalf of David and Nick, thank you. This uh, annual, this monthly webinar series is a uh, moral imperative to rally around and act on this massive technological opportunity in Nick's words and foreboding extinction event in David's words. Um, so the event after Gopi in April will be with Tony Gaffney, executive director of Vector Institute. And uh, in addition to that, Nick and David are available for general board briefings on AI and digital transformation. And as you know, David uh, is putting out lots of corporate governance content and is available for board evaluations, chair advisory, et cetera. So thanks for participating. Please reach out with any questions and uh, grateful to have you all here on behalf of the team. Thank you.